Hi there, everybody, and welcome to All Things Irish and Rock and Roll. My name is Benny White, and together with uh, Brendan Finglas, we have been bringing you some interviews with some great Irish artists, uh, people who have been there from the very beginning, people who paved the way for all of the great Irish bands that are around today, uh, people who were there from the beginning, people like Ditch Cassidy, uh, the late great Ditch Cassidy, we've already brought you, uh, his take on life and uh, his ups and downs. Fabulous Eric Bell, of course, and Ted Lizzie. We had him on. We had John McCann. And this week is no exception whatsoever. This is Pat Farrell. And Pat is going to talk about his life in the music business. Pat was there at the beginning. Um, we were both members of the Heraldites, uh, Evening Herald Club. Uh, and we went to see Ditch uh, together one time, but we didn't know each other then. Anyway, Pat is one of the foremost uh, uh, blues guitar players and rock guitar players that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, knowing, and I think maybe once or twice played with him. So we're going to get um, uh, Pat's views on things, and uh, I'd like to ask Pat, if you're ready there, Pat, that who were your influences at the beginning? I suppose uh, most people my age, it was the Beatles that turned me on. Uh, eventually I found something because up to then there was uh, not stuff that I was really into on the radio. And all we had was Radio 1 or maybe BBC. But Beatles came along and uh, I got totally into that. Especially Rubber Soul. Uh, just the guitar sounds and the tunes and that. Beautiful. And then Hendrix, of course. Uh, the opening lines on Purple Haze. Uh, life changed for me. Uh, I want a piece of that. What the hell is going on here? So I eventually uh, saved up two and six a week and I got an Eggman's guitar, a place called Tommy Moore's um, in Parnell Street, as far as I remember. And uh, the Eggman had a, a little pickup on it because I knew eventually we we're going to go electric. And uh, I put a little band together from guys, my friends, Mick Hayes, Frank Brady, and we uh, practice all the time. And we got into BB King then after a while, and we sort of formed a little blues sort of band. Did a few gigs around, and uh, I suppose went into um, more sort of professional, if I want to put it like that, later on with a man called Jangle Dangle. I met Jimmy Faulkner, who I'd uh, admired from afar, and uh, I couldn't believe when he asked me to join a band that he was putting together. So I loved that. I had a great time with them. What year would that have been? Oh, we're talking 1967, when it was 68, when Mick Hayes and Frank Brady were put yeah. together. Yeah. <clears throat> and we had two acoustic guitars, so the, the Eggman had a pick up on it. But before we got amplifiers and all of that, we used to <coughs> get gigs in um, St. Anthony's Hall. And uh, all the women would come in from bingo <coughs> and we'd be there <coughs> uh, laying the blues on them. <laughs> Needless to say, <laughs> didn't go down too good. <laughs> uh, <coughs> went to a lot of gigs uh, to see bands like Skid Row, The Sugar Shack. Um, I remember bands coming down from, the, the Methods came down from the north, and we saw them in the Gogo, -Go, Club of Gogo. -Go. So it was a five club, 72 club, Club of Gogo, -Go, and I think it was Arthur's. And that's where I would see bands live. Uh, later on, I was to join a, a band called Mousetrap. They were more sort of a, a pop band, but it gave me a good inside help things work and how things happen and I remember the only tune I used to enjoy playing with them was uh, Black Knight with Deep Purple <coughs> uh, that was a great old riff on that <coughs> so yeah. I enjoyed that mm. but as I say it gave me a good experience of you know getting into a band and how things work and how things happen and all that mm -hmm. so that was all good mm -hmm. but I uh, always wanted a, the Sugar Shack were a, a favourite band of mine I love the way they played. Dermot Woodfull was the lead guitar player. And uh, I used to really annoy him. I could be there in front of his uh, guitar every night. 
And at the break, I'll be asked, what plectrums do you use? What strings do you use? What amp do you use? What do you do? How do you do this? How do you do that? And he was trying to go down and talk to his girlfriend, but I was having none of that. Was just, this was too important. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you remember about, um, you know, uh, Ditch Cassidy, uh, for instance, what do you remember about Ditch and have you ever met him? Ditch was an institution. Um, I was a member of the Herdeldites Club, uh, Uncle Bill, and uh, they used to put on these events. And one of the events was in the SFX, and I think there was a couple of show bands on. I think BP Fallon was actually on. And then who comes on? The King Bees. And they knocked the socks off me. Little did I know that it was Ditch Cassidy, uh, Lee Sayer, who later on uh, became a close friend and played with him on numerous occasions. And uh, as I say, Ditch is an institution. And uh, a great soul, man. <clears throat> um, that's about it with Ditch, yeah. The Brush, I uh, went to see Skid Row, I don't know how many times. Um, we actually used to arrive early at some gigs just to hear them sound checking and stuff like that. And I remember they were playing in Liberty Hall and they were finished sound checking and Gary just kept playing and I could see him just honing uh, his uh, sound and his, his technique. And uh, it was just wonderful, and I, I knew where he was coming from. He's listening to all the same things I'm listening to, you know. And to see him honing into it, it was beautiful. <clears throat> it was probably one of the best times I heard him play. He had a white telecaster and a 50 watt Marshall lamp, and he used to knock this incredible sound out of it. Uh, Skid Row, um, Brush later on when I was playing with Jangle Dangle, uh, as you know, that Skid Row broke up. And the brush asked me to, to join. Uh, at that stage, uh, uh, I just knew that <clears throat> there's no way I'm going to be able to fill Gary's shoes. So I, um, I declined. But later on, I was to join the brush for, I think, a one year period, and about a year and a half. And uh, a wonderful man. I love him to pieces. He became a mentor and uh, did some really nice things for myself and my Uncle Morris. He looked after my Uncle Morris, great. And uh, I still see him saw him a few weeks ago in town, I can't remember the name of the club, where he was playing all the old Skid, Re- Skid Row tunes with his son Jude and uh, Grant Nicholas. And it was one of it that he's uh, playing still brilliant, you know. Mm. Mm. And we keep in touch all the time. Mm. Uh, very fond of that man. It's a band called Sundown that I formed with uh, my good friend Declan McNeilis. As I was saying earlier, um, we had a little band with Mick Hayes and Frank Brady. Frank Brady went off to, he got more into the folk sort of music. So Declan came in and he was an excellent bass player uh, even in those days. So we formed a band called Sundown with uh, James Delaney and John McCann. And uh, Smiley was actually the manager. I used to play in Morans all that, and we do gigs and draw uh, Kilkenny, Corp, that kind of stuff. And that lasted a few years before I met up with Jimmy again, and he told me that he had met Red Peters, and that Red Peters was willing, or uh, yeah, he sort of wanted to come into an electric band. Because the first time I'd seen Red Peters was down in Slattery's down the basement when they had the Irish Blues Appreciation Society. <laughs> uh, we weren't drinking in those days, we were drinking uh, Club Orange or whatever it was. And Larry Roddy would have uh, real to real tapes and he'd be talking about some house and give a bit of a lecture on it and play some tracks. And then he said, we're going to have uh, some live music. And uh, this voice, Red was sitting on the stairs, and this voice, I didn't know what was after happening to me, you know. <laughs> it was like, you know, the shivers on the backbone, all that sort of stuff happened. I couldn't believe uh, Red's voice. And uh, for years, I was uh, afraid to go near him, like, this man must be from another planet. Anyways, Jimmy met him, and he was, uh, yeah, he'd like to join an electric man. 
So we fired again with Declan McNeilis, Jimmy Faulkner, uh, Fran Breen, Red, obviously, and myself. Uh, we called the, the Floating Dublin Blues Band, Red Peter's Floating Dublin Blues Band. And we played in the meeting place every Sunday. And it went on for years and years and years. And uh, I just loved my time with Red. Um, Red would teach you things, but not in a way of um, written down, or it was just his feel, his whole approach to music and his way of doing it. Mm. Uh, I loved, and I loved uh, playing with Jimmy. We'd have these twin line guitar things going on. And uh, we weren't just a band, like we we used to hang out, like we were sort of a gang more than a band. Mm. <laughs> and uh, had wonderful times with Red. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, Red's no longer with us, nor Jimmy, nor Declan. It's, uh, sometimes I look at the photograph and, uh, you know, it's a bit, there's only Fran Brain and myself left from that lineup. Mm. But uh, <clears throat> I had wonderful times, wonderful, wonderful times playing with And there's uh, some recordings of that period of time. We had a, a live recording out in the Porty Kitchen, I think. Um, Declan and Jimmy went on to form Hotfoot. Mm. Unfortunately, Declan was killed down in Limerick <clears throat> after a gig. Uh, very sad circumstances. Um, yeah, they were all the, you know, I, I still think we're all going to meet up at some stage and yeah. wherever it might be. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure Declan has the clouds organised. We rub them off them. <laughs> we have some blues for you, not just regular old blues, we have some brilliant blues for you. Will you welcome, please, with the Dublin Blues Band, the Redan of the Mr. Red Peters. Yay! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
was playing with the Plattermen and the Plattermen were coming to an end but it was also pre-planned that Rob Strong was going to start the Rob Strong band and again I was invited to join that and I was delighted to. Uh, Philip got a gig with Donovan for the, the last two months he was gone from the Plattermen and I stood in for Philip and then the first Rob Strong band evolved and I spent a, a good while with Rob. And again, another education, uh, the man's bass playing and that voice that he had and uh, lots of original tunes, very funky, you know, and I loved that. And shortly after that, I, that's when I had my little stint with the brush, I think for a year. And then I think I went to London and I came back and rejoined the brush. Um, after that, uh, I met up with Earl Walsh. I met up with Don Baker. And for some reason, we came back to my place. So there was always jamming in those days. That's the thing that doesn't, I don't think happens enough these days. <clears throat> in those days, everywhere, there was always a pad man. <laughs> and uh, people would, uh, arrived back and the guitars just automatically came out and mm. people would jam and jam there all night and this is where you pick up loads of stuff and people would be bringing you into directions that you never really went before and uh, it's a, a great learning curve and I was lucky enough to play with all these wonderful brilliant musicians you know loved it so uh, a certain period uh, we're having some jam and it was either Don or Earl <clears throat> hey this is not bad you know why don't we, we just form a, a band just for a Sunday afternoon thing. So we drafted in Tommy Moore and Fran Breen again. So it was Errol, Don, Tommy, uh, who did I mention? Fran. Fran and myself and we called it The Business. And we started in Slattery's in 1981. And there was, we were really enjoying it, but there wasn't many there. Uh, but later on in life, I've met about a thousand people that said they were there. <laughs> 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 anyway, the, the band sort of took off, and it really took off big time. And whatever else everybody was into, they sort of left and just concentrated on the business and uh, we used to get loads of work and uh, our base was slappy so it was the main sort of uh, a, hub yeah <clears throat> forgot a euro for everyone that was at uh, slappy's or said they were at slappy's mm. be a rich man but we had wonderful times and as bands do i mean the band has gone over 30 years now so obviously uh, people come and go for various different reasons uh, either go on to a, form another band or get invited to other people or whatever <clears throat> but uh, I still keep the band going um, and that's from uh, doing right up to now over the years uh, we've uh, recorded a few albums uh, loads of TV played all over the country we actually went to Russia uh, last year we were in Copenhagen and uh, we just keep rocking away, and I love it. Uh, I think you were asking about my guitars. Um, in 1978, um, the Brush had this guitar made by Derek Nelson that I really liked. So uh, I went out to Derek and after a few conversations, 
he's, we just started, I asked him, will he build me a guitar? So I just sort of asked him what shape, and I didn't want any fancy doodads on it. I wanted a plain piece of wood. And that's the way he built it. And he came around for about a month, uh, just to, to you know, change something or alter something. And uh, a wonderful guy. And I still use that guitar to him today. Plus I got myself, well I got presents uh, of a 335. Nice. That, I, that I still use as well uh, for the more quieter type of gigs. Mm. So, yeah, we, we do sort of, you know, uh, what would you say, ambience music sometimes, uh, jazzy, bluesy kind of stuff. Mm. That, that's another aspect to the music, and I love doing that as well. Uh, throughout my life, uh, the main ingredient and the uh, most important kind of music I was into is the blues and sometimes I can't even stand the word of blues because people have different interpretations of what it is and for the non-initiated they think I woke up this morning baby left me and I, and I can't stand that trust me man because the blues is a big picture and um, we came across B.B. King I, I suppose it was tr through a uh, you know, we got interested in Hendrix. Hendrix also led us into bands that were happening in, in London. There was the Blues Boom. And we got really involved with that. Uh, John Mayer's Blues Breakers, especially the Beano album, when Clapton was playing. And I think when Clapton was playing at his best. And he spoke about all these Hubert Sumlin and Muddy Waters and Freddie King. <clears throat> And BB King, I mean, we have to source, you know, who are these guys? Like, we, you wouldn't hear them on the radio. So you'd have to go out of your way to try and find them. Uh, so we got a, a land of an album from the USA record stores, who uh, <clears throat> kindly sponsored the arts. And uh, it was the R&B soul of BB King, carny title. But the music on it was just, uh, I mean, when I got it, I, it just never came off the turntable. Listened to that man morning, down and night. I just loved his, uh, his style, his, his expression, and the beautiful way he played. Uh, later on in life, uh, the business got to do support to BB King in the stadium, and got to meet the man, not for very long, but uh, I met him, and uh, that was a big thrill for me. Be thrilled to be on the same uh, bill as uh, your hero kind of thing. Uh, I always loved the blues, um, but I, I listen to lots of other music. Uh, I love Mozart. Uh, I love um, the prog rock, the Wishbone Nash. Um, those kind of bands I love. Um, at the moment, I'm listening to Steve Vai who has uh, very much tongue in cheek, but he's a virtuoso, you know? And I love his theatrics, but he has some beautiful playing as well. Uh, I, I, uh, it goes from acoustic players to rock, and it's not, not necessarily all guitar players, but Herbie Hancock. Um, all different styles, mm. some Irish music, uh, Moving Hearts, I thought had some great uh, vibe going on. And uh, I think Victor Wooten picked up on them and brought Davy Spillane in on uh, some of his albums. So the music, yeah, can, I think the blues can be brought into loads. You can hear it in loads of music as well. I mean, Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd, so he plays some very bluesy sort of uh, sequences. And it fits in perfectly with this sort of spacey thing going on. Mm. Um, and I think uh, the, like Deep Purple and the uh, Zeppelins and all of this were, were all totally influenced by uh, the blues. It's a gas story of uh, the, the Zepps calling in to uh, Willie Dixon's place. Willie Dixon sort of had an open house, he had a, re a recording studio downstairs. And uh, Stones used to call by, and anyone that was in town used to drop in. So the Zeps called in and had blah, 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 and they left an album. 
And Willie Dixon's uh, wife uh, put the album on later on. And she said, Hey, Willie, they're playing all your tunes. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a call case about that. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, there's loads of different styles of music. And I think everyone should always have an open ear. Um, I think it's bad just to be... Just to, uh, you can get into a rush and you can just get... Uh, um, you, you just get comfortable with in your zone. It's lovely when playing with other musicians that get you out of that. There's other ways of doing things. And I play, I play with Mick Pyro. He used to play the Republic of Loose. Uh, he's very inventive and uh, brings out all this sort of uh, Frank Zappa kind of stuff with the blues, you know. Mm. And I love that as well. Mm. So it's always interesting. You never stop learning. Anyone that thinks they have it together should throw up the lippy. Mm. Um, you never stop learning. There's always something new, something different, and something else to get into. Okay. Well, as I said, uh, I used to frequent um, the Club of Gogo and the 72 Club and the 5 Club. And the type of bands were Skid Row, Sugar Shack, I used to follow everywhere. And... Um, there was also, in those days, there was the tennis clubs. And in my case, I lived in Fairview. So it was the CYMS in Fairview, which was an old wooden building. And all these bands used to come out and play there. And I mean, here's the, the, the caliber of Skid Row and all the, and Method and the few from the north uh, would come down and play every Sunday. And it was supposed to be a dance. I mean, there's people dancing all right, but uh, you never saw me dancing. I was always up front checking out the band, checking out the gear, especially all the lead guitar players. I used to give them a terrible time. <laughs> um, I saw Gary there, and he was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, I saw people down in the Club of Gogo, as I say, as well as the Method, the Method from the North. And it was the first time I actually saw a Marshall stack I knew all about them, saw them photographs, but I uh, never saw one live. Mm. And uh, the bands from the north had much more access to gear than the southern bands, it was obvious to, in those days. Uh, Wilker Campbell, I think, was the drummer, and he had a double bass uh, kit, you know. First time we saw all that. And a wah wah pedal as well from, what was it, uh, Dave Lewis, mm. I think, was the lead guitar player. Um, again, I would be asking him loads of things. Uh, <clears throat> Dermot Woodfull was very generous to, with his time with me, you know, because I'm sure um, I used to annoy him a lot. But we used to give him a lifting with the gear. Mm. We could get our hands on the gear, like, you know, <laughs> feel yeah. it, mm. and give them a lift out. Mm. And I'm sure they enjoyed that. But as well as the CY, there was St. Vincent's, there was St. Paul's, uh, there were all school halls, and O'Connell's Hall. I remember seeing the queuing up for a skid row. The queue was going out onto the North Circular Road. It was uh, you know, tons of people going in mm. to, to watch these bands. Um, Terry O'Neill managed Skid Row at the time, who later on became manager of Jangle Dangle that I mentioned, that I played with. Um, I still see lots of those people now. I, remember, I was a junior postman at one stage, and the uh, they used to put on a dance for the, the junior postman once a year. And the only thing, there was no women in it. <laughs> just a lot of blocks. <laughs> so I needless to say, um, we weren't dancing. <laughs> but uh, the Black Eagles... They wouldn't know, would they? <laughs> get their probably <body> put. <laughs> uh, the Black Eagles were always the band. The Black Eagles comprised of uh, Phil Linus and Brian Downey on the drums. That was the first time I'd seen Phil, and the first time I saw Brian. Um, Brian be, became the drummer of the Sugar Shack then, and as we know, I uh, went on to play with Lizzie. And uh, I haven't seen Brian in a while, but uh, Brian actually had a stint with the business at one stage. Mm. So it was great to have all these people that you used to go around and watch, mm. and you get to play with them, you know? That's a big buzz. I love those times. Uh, there was really healthy scene for, for bands and, and players. And uh, 
there are good musicians. I don't remember seeing like a bad band, like even the the more poppy type of bands, like the Strangers. Like I used to go and watch them. Uh, Len Guest on guitar and Tommy, I can't tell you, was it Halfley on rhythm guitar? <coughs> and it, it, they used to get a beautiful sound. Mm. Mm. And there's bands like Reform and stuff, all great sort of uh, pop bands, and they were always uh, worth it. And it was really healthy because it was all those venues that I was talking about. And then on Sunday afternoons, it was the television club that used to be packed, all kids, you know, it was fantastic. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's no scene like that now. Everything is uh, immediate, you know, it's, it's all computer driven. And um, we play in a place called the Mez in Temple Bar. And I remember these, it was an early gig. <clears throat> and these kids came in and they were like, a gobsmacked, you know? It wasn't the, the play, they didn't, you never saw anyone playing instruments live before. Mm. I think, isn't that sad, you know? Mm. Mm. Obviously it's a sex factor. Mm. Won't use the word. Um, but it's, it's some young one out there screaming, uh, you know, and it's it's nothing to do with music. <clears throat> Those days, and uh, I've spoken to a good friend of mine, Nicky Ryan about it, and he's talking about it. It's a no place where it's, uh, <clears throat> where, where we used to go, like uh, the sea there was no drink or anything, but uh, it was it was great. Mm. It was all about the, the music and the players, mm. and uh, I find it sad that uh, some of those, well, most of those gigs are gone. I mean, they're all gone. So there's very little to replace them, and you have to hunt out if kids are interested in stuff. Uh, they have to hunt out, and there's not that many venues. There's there's JJ Smith, the Sweden's, there's the Mez, as I mentioned, and a few scattering of places in town where there used to be like hundreds. Mm. It's now very small, very small. There's still some, there still is lots of great musicians around, mm. but there isn't enough venues for them to play, mm. and it's not exposed enough for the, to the kids, mm. you know. Regrets now, if you have any regrets. Uh, I don't really have any regrets. I suppose uh, I would have liked things to maybe take off a bit more. I mean, people use this phrase, uh, making it. Sometimes I wonder, what the hell does that mean? You've made it, or I want to make it. Uh, it usually means money. I think that's what they mean, or fame, or stardom. Um, I was never money driven or never had that want to be famous sort of thing going on. Uh, I got into it because I loved the, the music, and I still do. And uh, that making a thing, I don't know, what does it mean? Um, I've had a, a good life as regards all that. I love the, the, the musicians, and I'm privileged to have played with some of the finest players. And uh, I've no regrets whatsoever about any of that. Um, I would have liked, and I suppose, maybe you got a bit more exposed, maybe a bit more reward for what you were doing, if that's the right word. Um, but I, I've, all, all in all, I've, I've loved it. Um, I remember jammed down in Brennan Fingles' place, and uh, we had a wonderful night, and it, that's nearly what it's all about. You have, you have these nights of music, and they, they say, with you for life. Um, they don't get lots of money. Make uh, lots of new friends. Um, female friends. <laughs> Which is nice. No, no. 